There we go. So just so you all know, we're recording today's session just so that we can make it available to anyone who couldn't attend uh, live to today's session. We may have some people coming in a little bit later, but for now, we'll just do the recording. It'll be posted live to the Faculty Learning Hub and shared out to the faculty community following this event um, at the end of the week. My name is Jocelyn Wilkinson. I'm the Educational Technologies Consultant in Teaching and Learning and I'll be your host for today's session. So I wanna take a look at some of the responses that are coming up here on our uh, word cloud. And a lot of the responses that we're seeing are things like access is important to you, engagement is important to you for your tech-enabled teaching, um, self-directed learning, creating, allowing things to be interactive, facilitating collaboration, uh, bringing about possibilities is a really interesting contribution. Safety, presence, new worlds to explore. So there's lots of ideas coming up here um, on the word cloud about why tech-enabled teaching is important to you. I'm going to let you all continue to contribute, if you would like, for just another minute or two. And then I want to compare this to what people said was important to them in 2019 at the first back, uh, the first Tech for Teaching Day. Inclusion, clarity, using time efficiently. Absolutely. I think my cats are about to join today's session. Let's take a look at what we said in 2019 was the reasons why tech for enabled teaching was important to us. So this is a word cloud from that group. We had over 100 contributions to that particular word cloud. And you can see that some of the ideas that we were sharing then about why tech was important to our teaching were uh, themes about engagement, that it would be fun, access, inclusion, staying current, staying flexible, collaboration. So many of those themes are holding true. But we have some new ideas developing and percolating about why technology is important to our teaching. And it's really interesting to watch that shift happen over change uh, over time, and especially over the last few years. So as we move through the presentation, you'll notice that you're coming along with me at home. Welcome to the, to the third annual Tech for Teaching Days. This is brought to you by Teaching and Learning. Uh, and in today's session, we're going to be doing a land acknowledgement and some welcoming remarks coming from Catherine Brillinger, the Director of Teaching and Learning. We have a faculty panel, uh, and you can see our panelists are here today. They've got their cameras on so we can see them. Uh, and I just want to extend a hearty thank you to all of our panelists for being available for today's session and for sharing uh, the projects that you've been working on. They're going to be really fantastic examples, I think, for everyone. During the faculty panel and afterwards, you'll have the chance to ask any questions to the panelists that you would like to ask. You can contribute those questions here in the Mentimeter. Um, I'll be turning on the ability to ask any questions on any particular slide. And then at the end, we'll have a little bit of time for trivia right before lunch. And at that trivia time, you'll have the chance to win one, or, one of three gifts from the bookstore, courtesy of Teaching and Learning. So to start it off, I'll pass things over to Catherine Brillinger, who will start us off with our land acknowledgement. Thanks so much, Jesslyn, and thank you everyone for being here. I'd like to acknowledge that the home that I'm in right now is on the traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabe, Anishinaabe sorry, and Haudenosaunee peoples. And depending on which campus you're joining us from or which area you live in, uh, you're probably on some treaty land. The land that I'm on where my home is was promised to the Six Nations of the Grand River as part of the Haldeman Tract uh, agreements that were made some time ago. So as we um, join together for this tech-enabled teaching um, opportunity, I want us to think about the land that we're on and what we could do personally to move forward truth and reconciliation or to care uh, 
more robustly for the earth. So for myself, um, I'm trying to change my gardening to native plants and attract pollinators and enrich the land. So I think it's important for us to think about this on a regular basis. So thank you for um, sharing in the land acknowledgement and please think about where you are yourself right now. And now I'd like to pass things over to Jesslyn and just start with a thank you to Jesslyn. She's pulled this together. It's absolutely amazing. And we're really excited to have faculty here. We know it's a busy time, um, but we also know that tech-enabled teaching has become such a huge part of our teaching lives uh, since the pandemic, before the pandemic, as you saw in 2019. And I think that we'll continue to learn and this is a great opportunity. So thank you, Jesslyn, and I'll pass it back to you. Thanks, Catherine. I know it's been a it's been a busy two years, hasn't it? Uh, and I appreciate that, you know, for a period of time, I was away for a little bit, um, raising my daughter for the first year of her life. But I felt like I was there in it with you all. Uh, I myself was a student at a fully remote university and was partaking in many of the same experiences that you all were going through just from the student perspective and the student lens. So it really is um, a joy to come back to the college and to see some of the projects that I had left off uh, kind of come to fruition and people sharing their experience of how they implemented those projects into their teaching and into learning experiences. So in today's session, we're going to be um, we're going to be sharing some of the experiences from our faculty panelists. Many of them have been working on these projects for the past year two years, in some cases, much longer. Rita, I'm sure you'll share a lot of history uh, with your particular projects. Um, but these are really projects that are oriented towards boosting the experience of students um, in a way that supported that remote, online, synchronous, um, learning experience that, that many students were getting. And these were projects that were in the works before probably even before the the pandemic started so sometimes it's really interesting to see what's been out there and for how long so we're going to kick off with the innovators panel and i just want to introduce the the members of the panel today so today we have five members of the faculty or of the teaching community here at conestoga we have chris harnock who joins us from trades and apprenticeship rita palacios is joining us from interdisciplinary studies Chance McFarlane also joins us from Trades and Apprenticeship today. Carly Sabo is joining us from Canadian Institute from, for Seniors Care. And Adam Ziegler is joining us from Community Services. And each of these panelists is going to take a minute or two to share some of the projects that they've been working on. You'll see some of their, their actual examples and they'll hopefully share their insight. I want to point out that on the slides, you'll see that you have the ability to use this uh, questions uh, icon, not the comments one, but this little question format to add any questions that you might have for the panelists. I'll see those questions as they come in. And if they specifically relate to this panelist, then I'll probably ask it directly to the panelists themselves. If it relates to a broader question, then I'll probably hold it for the end where we can have each of the panelists weigh in on different questions as they're asked. So no question is a bad question. Go ahead and ask as many as you like. Uh, for our members in the audience, you can also like some of the questions as they come through, which would tell me that you also are curious about seeing the answer to that particular question. So go ahead and keep an eye on your device. Make sure that you can participate in the q and I'll share the link in the chat window just one last time to make sure anybody who might have come late can get into the presentation. And with that, I'm going to invite Chris Harnock from Trades and Apprenticeship, who will be sharing his experiences in developing H5P interactives for, virtual, uh, for a virtual tour. Chris, go ahead and uh, share your screen. And while you share your screen, I'll introduce you. So Chris Harnock joined Conestoga College after successfully becoming an electrician and working in service and construction roles in residential, ICI, and agricultural industries. Since starting with the college, Chris has been part of the developing of developing and delivering new courses and programs in the electrical and construction trades. As part of this development, 
researching and leveraging technology to enhance the student experience and maintain the high standards demanded by the industry has become his primary focus. Currently, the focus has been on interactive 360 presentations to allow for flexible study while being able to maximize on-campus time. Take it away, Chris. Thanks, Jesslyn. Thanks, everybody, for coming today and having me here. Um, so like Jesslyn said, I'm in the trades and apprenticeship field and specifically the construction trades. And this project uh, has been in the works since, again, before the pandemic uh, struck. Um, but the main focus uh, became extremely important during the pandemic. And the whole idea was that when we teach uh, with a lot of our uh, content, uh, context is very important, as well as experience. And teaching in post-secondary specifically, um, a lot of our students don't have uh, job site experience. And so they lose the context with which we're talking about a particular topic. So if I'm talking about a way to install something, um, sounds really easy when I'm standing on the ground, but if I'm 30 feet in the air on a lift, um, it changes the situation dramatically. So um, originally we had designed or, or tried to do something like this with our college campus because we would do um, physical walking tours of the mechanical spine of the college. So we would talk about a couple of topics in class, go take a tour and be able to point to these items, devices, as they kind of sit in their natural environment. So we kind of get a little bit more, we were able to bring some students a little bit of, of the experience that they would get if they were out working. Um, so that was kind of the goal. And then of course the pandemic hit and then this became a very much priority. So our, our main objectives was to allow students access to the lab without being here. So one of the things that happened is that I've been on campus since, um, well, since we shut down or we opened up again in labs. And, but we had to leverage our time much more when we were on campus. Uh, normally our labs are fairly open access. We'll meet students whenever they need to, be able to have a conversation in the lab and then point at devices, take, bring, uh, bring devices to the table, take them apart and really be able to drill down deep. Um, having a limited amount of time and at certain points of the years, um, we were told you're only allowed to be on campus for this amount of time and then you've got to leave. So it really did kind of hamper a lot of our ability to do what we normally would do. Um, and the secondary directive was going to be to kind of develop this repository of knowledge. So instead of having things in files and Word documents, is actually kind of presented in a much more interactive manner that uh, tied the theoretical information with the physical and practical parts of what we we're trying to teach. Um, so I've got a couple of these. I just have the links to the um, 5P uh, site. So just to show you what we're going through. So um, when I first contacted Jesslyn about doing this, um, full disclosure, I'm an electrician. I can hook anything up. Uh, the computer side of things, uh, not necessarily where I spent any or any of my spare time at all. So this was a really big learning curve as far as I'm just finding out what was possible. Of course, I had pretty incredible ideas in my mind of what could happen. It was just a matter of if they were realistic or not. So it took a while to figure out exactly what was going on and how I could use this technology. So this looks really nice because of the VR group the college here helped take kind of what we put together and made it look a little bit more professional than maybe um, I was able to do. So it was a really good experience um, with working with that group of people. So what we've done is we created a little bit of a 360 tour of these labs. And so as a, as a way to give the students an ability to become familiar with the um, layout of the lab, where everything was located, what our uh, SOPs were going to be once we got into the lab, cover off some safety items without actually being able to walk through the, the building and walk into the room was going to be one of our main focus. In this particular lab, there's all, they're all identical stations, so we're able to just do one presentation and be able to go from there. So 
what we were able to do is do things like be able to pull up videos of uh, components and so embed them. So when I talk about something in a, in a theory class, they can go here, find that little snippet about how this particular motor works and helps keep that information a little bit more fresh. The intention is that they would go and review this before they came into the lab. So uh, helps our lab go a little bit more smooth. Again, we were really cramped for time and how much we were able to actually spend. So if you took a little bit longer in the lab, that was gonna be kind of a problem. We're also able to um, kind of drill down and get pull information off of devices so that if we're asking questions in a pre-lab assignment, they didn't have to actually be in the lab to get it. Um, they could also, if they were curious, and as part of our lesson, we would talk about this, they could revisit it, look at our lesson, look at our PowerPoints, and then link it up to what the actual devices look like. The internet has tons of information that is sometimes even correct. Um, so anytime that we can bring information off of the equipment that the students are gonna have hands on, we try to do that as much as possible because in our particular trade, and a lot of construction trades, um, our default is to read the manual and go look at what we're going to do and figure it out from there. So we're able to do things like um, embed different presentations um, in the same virtual tour. And this way, we're able to create much, uh, a much deeper layering so that we can get into finer and finer detail as we get in here. So we're able to open up the cabinet, look at a 40 person contactor, have pictures on all of the sides so that we can see what it looks like on the front. We can call uh, call attention to detail when we do a lesson so that when they get into the lab, now all of a sudden it's like, well, I don't know where the starter uh, overload contacts are. I've got a picture of the whole thing. I can look on the left-hand side and I can see that there's um, screws on the side. This gets built into our theory lessons so that uh, if we're sitting at home I was sitting in the basement with a table of various electronic and electrical devices beside me. Um, without the students having access and pulling, uh, be able to pass it around the room and, and hand it out to everybody, we get a little bit closer to being able to see exactly what we're talking about. So it's not gonna be the very, when they come into the lab, it's not the first time they see anything. They're able to do investigating. And again, by directing them to these particular pieces of equipment, apparently some stuff is missing, um, that we're able to highlight some details that would normally take more time in the lab class and now we're able to, to, to use that time for getting work done and some of the other objectives. Um, so that was one. And the other one I had queued up here already. This one's a lot more, this is a way more dynamic lab. So this one is a basically a commercial installation lab. It's actually two levels and all the projects are different. So we had to get a lot more information out. So typically in this lab, the students actually cycle through 11 different projects. So that's a lot of information to get out. And if we can't sit in the lab and do what we would call a tailgate meeting, which is basically just walk through the projects and have site meetings and they can ask questions, we had to really figure out a way to leverage this. So with all of these projects, they get, um, they get a lay of the land to see exactly where they're gonna be going to work. We've got um, a picture that shows the layout of this board in particular for this one. And then we've also got a little video. And so what would happen is that I had to do these videos um, the day before classes started. So it's basically me with my phone and as I play a couple, uh, my hand, and it's, I'm just pointing at things. And it's essentially what we would do in person is just walk around, they would ask questions, we'd point at things and we're actually, again, it's, it's very similar to what a site meeting would be on a job site. You get an idea what the expectations are and what the scope of the project is. So we're able to, again, navigate the shop. I can do all my safety training. I can identify all of the projects um, at the at one time online, 
it all still has to get repeated. A lot of it has to get repeated in person. But now this is one more time that they've seen things. So we're able to do, again, things like this, have the panel closed, have it open, see the circuitry, but then also the information that's on the inside of a lot of panels, it's all in there. We can give them access to everything as if they were there. Um, Chris, and Jessalyn can, I... can tell me when it's time to stop talking. Yeah, it's about that time, Chris. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Yeah. All right. Uh, I want to give you kudos as well, because you really, um, you really had a, like a big vision in your head. You wanted students to be able to be on campus without being on campus. And you knew exactly what you wanted it to look like. You were just like, can somebody help me with this? Uh, and we were really lucky that you are as organized as you are, because this was multiple rooms across multiple sites and it was multiple items within multiple rooms. And you really came through with having not only a really organized file, like being willing to go and take those pictures just using your phone and taking those videos just using your phone because you knew exactly what it needed to be. And then organizing them into a file structure that uh, and having like a flow chart, you built like a flow chart of like what you wanted it to work with. Um, and that made it really easy for um, for the VAR lab to kind of step in and say, okay, let's just put it together uh, and let's just make it. Um, and you and I had kind of worked on this project, just the two of us for about a year and then sort of the pandemic hit and we needed it sort of right away. And it really ended up coming together. Um, but I remember too, we had some support from the library was uh, willing to pitch in and, and buy some necessary equipment, the camera. We ended up getting it a different way, I think. Uh, so for those of you who are interested, Conestoga does have a 360 camera for the use for this type of project. Um, and the VAR lab was brand new and they were willing to jump in on the project. Um, and so thank you to them. And then your chair was really supportive as well. Uh, so we got a lot of help along the way. Uh, Cause for a little while, it was just me and you slugging it out and trying to build a mock-up of what it is that you wanted to build. Yeah. No, that was, yeah, that was very helpful that everybody kind of kind of grabbed hold of this and kind of pushed when they needed to. <laughs> and you have a you have a fan in the audience saying that uh, they have a, a yeah. son starting in the electrical tech program in the fall. It's like an open house for them as a parent. <laughs> well, that's good. He's going to love it. Now, I have a kind of follow up question. What does this mean for you now that your program's moving over to Reuters once it opens? I have to do it all we... over again. Um... <laughs> So, yeah, actually, so it's good that um, you asked that because uh, Lisa Tremble, who's here, has um, we've kind of reached out. And so we've got these ideas. And of course, we've got bigger ideas and, and, and better ones, um, which are now well beyond my ability to, to, to execute. Um, but we have the same kind of idea we want to do. It's just now we've got brand new labs we're, we're working on in a brand new space. And um, I think at this point too, we're actually looking forward once we have access to this new building. And of course we, you know, shake the wrinkles out and get a year under our belt that it's built in such a way that it's exposing a lot of the systems that go together for a commercial building. And that's where we're gonna really start to realize the idea or the, or the, the plan of being able to walk through a building and point at all these systems and really create the links between this is what we talked about in the theory class. This is what you built in the lab. And now this is what it looks like full scale um, in real life. Beautiful. Yeah, thank you so much, Chris. It's such a great um, project. It really came together for us. Um, and, and I'm just looking forward to where you take it next. Uh, I well, think thanks for your help on that too. Yeah, I Thanks. think you'll get a lot of questions in the Q&A time. Okay. All right. So next, I want to introduce Rita Palacio. And let me just pull up Rita's bio here. So Rita, go ahead and share your screen while I read your bio. Rita Palacio is a language professor in the School of Interdisciplinary Studies at Conestoga College. She received her PhD in Latin American Literature from the University of Toronto and specializes in contemporary Maya cultural production, literature and art from Guatemala. She co-authored Unwriting Maya Literature, 
SIB as Recorded Knowledge 2019 with an honorable mention for 2020 Best Book in the Humanities, Lhasa, Mexico section with Dr. Paul M. Worley from Western Carolina University and has published articles on Maya literature, performance and art. In 2022, she completed two OERs, Introduction to French and Introduction to Spanish with funding from eCampus Ontario's Central Virtual Learning Platform funded support program. Take it away. Okay, thank you so much, Jesslyn. Uh, and thank you, Chris. That was amazing. It's going to be a tough one to follow up. Um, I would try my best, but that was awesome. Oh my God, I have so many ideas for things I want to do for our language classes now. Um, but uh, thank you so much uh, for inviting me, Jesslyn. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm really happy to be able to tell you a little bit about the stuff we've been doing uh, for the language classroom. And also, um, I wanted to thank Catherine for the land acknowledgement. Just to quickly add, I'm coming to you from Hidalgo, Mexico. This is, I, I'm actually in the home of the Nyanyu and the Nyuhu people. And I'm here doing a little bit of work, um, thanks to a Global Affairs grant. And so hopefully we'll bring other cool things to our students. And maybe in the next uh, next time we talk about tech, we can talk about uh, this kind of exchange. I'm trying to do a virtual exchange uh, for students so they can practice their Spanish and students here can practice their English. So we're pretty excited about that. So let me tell you a little bit about some of the stuff that, uh, oops, that I'm doing. Uh, so a little while back, we created two OERs, so two open educational resources with support from the library. We created one for French and Spanish because we didn't have a textbook. And students, even if we put one, even we requested one, they would not buy it. So we were using, we were using some um, resources that were available online, but some of them were too, they just did not fit. And so we uh, found some that we liked and we transformed them. The introduction to French is actually an adaptation from two other OERs. And then the introduction to Spanish is one that I did from scratch. Uh, the first versions of these OERs, and you can see the covers here, um, where we just sh shared them as PDFs with students, um, and then we put them on press books. There were really no interactive elements, and most of the stuff was, you know, free images from Unsplash and that kind of thing. So it was nothing fancy. You can see the covers. That was my attempt at a nice cover from Canva, uh, but it was very much, you know, just try to get it together and share something. Uh, this past, um, this past, I guess. I guess this semester, it just it just happened in January. Uh, we were awarded a grant for from the from eCampus Ontario to complete our OERs because we had we had them on press books and they were nice, but again, they were sort of like you know free images, stuff that we could find uh, that was open source, which is great, but it wasn't it wasn't it didn't look nice, it didn't look cohesive. So with this funding, we were able to do a whole lot and we're actually really happy. So some of the things we were able to do was make uh, use graphics that were all consistent throughout. So that was really nice. And here you can see one of the images. And it was really nice too, because we worked with um, um, the vendor who was a, uh, I'm trying to remember the name. No, the name has completely uh, slipped me, but they were fabulous. And for example, we requested that some of the images were uh, diverse. We didn't want most of the stock images like were white people. <laughs> so we said, can we have more diversity? And they, you know, they complied. So that was great. Uh, we also added H5P exercises. And this was with the help of actually someone who's in the audience, uh, Betty Munera. She was awesome. We had been working, working for a long time on creating H5P exercises, uh, just playing with them. And so it was nice because we were able to incorporate them. We also got some short animations and I will show you one uh, later on. Uh, some audio files and some custom CSS, which I'm not really sure what it means, to be honest. <laughs> this was from Library Services, Holly. Uh, she was amazing and she was the one who said, well, that's, this is what we need. And I trusted her completely. So she, she helped me with this. For the funding, I should say, um, we worked with Kim Carter, who's fabulous. She was a liaison between uh, eCampus Ontario and Conestoga and she helped us um, complete the funding um, application and, and sort of help, held my hand throughout the whole process because it was a huge steep learning curve for me. So let me show you what this looks like. Uh, so this is the French and you can see one of the images is again uh, very consistent with the others. And I'm just going to play a couple of these so you can get an idea of, of the audio, which is so important in the language classroom. 
And I should mention, this is quite exciting for us because the pronunciation actually is French from Quebec. Uh, and I was quite insistent on that. If we're gonna have, um, if we're going to have, oh, I don't know how to go back, here we go. If we're going to have French, it has to reflect a Canadian reality. <laughs> so uh, so went from one of the colleges in, uh, oh, I forget the name, in Ottawa, which is a French college, a Francophone college. They were very nice and they recorded for us all the audio that we have in the French section. Um, so how, how did we create and use H5P? H5P was ideal. They, they give you exercises that are perfect for language learning. There's a lot of fill in the blank and drag and drop and memory. And now I'm finding out about this virtual 360, which is fabulous. Uh, but one of the things that it's really helpful for is for captioning videos. And this was interesting because Pressbooks wasn't that great when it came to uh, integrating an animation and then captioning. We had to provide a translation script and it looked really sloppy because it would opened up in a Word document. So this is this is all thanks to a vendor. They, they found this workaround and, and you can do this. And you can see the, the, the little uh, screen cap of the, uh, of the animation. But this was fabulous and I can't recommend it enough, especially because you can pair it with interactive exercises. We didn't get that far uh, because with the funding, it was actually extreme, extremely quick turnaround to um, do this, but just to give you an example, this is one of the drag and drop uh, exercises that we have. Uh, you know, just drop it in wherever. Um, of course, I'm trying to do it correctly. Isn't that what we do? <laughs> Professors are always like, I will get it right. Um, Rita, it, it we're is. seeing we're seeing creating and using H5P. Oh, you're not um, seeing. Oh, sorry. No, you might need to reshare. Okay. Just share your whole screen. Okay. Let me just see. Oh, I thought I thought it's not taking you there when I click on this. Uh, cause that's not great. I think you're All just right. sharing your PowerPoint. So just reshare and share your whole Okay. Screen. I thought, I thought the PowerPoint was, it was linked. Okay. We can do this. Oh, it still sure. looks really nice. You really <laughs> like your PowerPoint skills are top notch. <laughs> oh boy. Thank you. Anyway. Okay. So this is an example of the drag and drop that we created. And again, like I was saying, and I was actually doing this while I was talking, but you know, just, just filling it out. And if you haven't done this, it's the best for, for classes. It's just, it's interactive. It's easy. It's really easy to create once you get the hang of it. And we got really good. Thanks to Betty. Betty was a pro at this. Um, so it just gives you that. And, and you can really customize it. So for a language classroom, for example, you get fabuloso, right? Which is great because then you're doing that in the target language as well. Uh, here's another one. This one, you actually write down the numbers. Uh, then there's one that's not as interactive, but I want to show you a little animation and I think you can hear it. There is closed captioning, so you can turn it off or on. It, the, the funny thing is it's in the text anyway, in the, sorry, in the animation. ¿Cuál es tu número de teléfono? Mi número es uno, cuatro, dos, seis, tres, ocho, cero. So that's just a quick thing that, you know, anyone, uh, it, students are going through it and they, you know, because it's a, if, if it's a self-paced thing, it's nice to have this kind of a break. Uh, and it's, the, the visual is really nice and all the images are really cute. So we have like animations all throughout on both texts and we actually were quite happy the way it turned out. Um, I think it was good. And so that's sort of um, my experience with the H5P. I, I am discovering new things that I think, you know, we wanna incorporate every time. There's one feature that, I played around with, but I believe it's still in beta. Uh, and it basically, you ask a student to say a word, like actually uh, record it. And then it tells you whether the pronunciation is good or not. Like it matches it to their own uh, database, which is fabulous, especially especially yeah. if you have anything like a vocab that's you know scientific or whatever, you can do the same thing because sometimes you don't know how to pronounce it, but it's still Rita. in beta, so I haven't gotten there. So that's I can it. literally <laughs> see your gears turning and I can see the ideas <laughs> sort of formulating. So I want to I want to touch on a little bit of historical info. When did you start working on your OERs? 2017. Long yeah. Time ago. yeah, yeah, yeah. So this has been a passion project for you for a really long time. And why was it important to you to um, to build these for students? So one of them, it's funny because it was the diploma classes, the language classes that didn't have a textbook and it wasn't required and students wanted something. Right. And the problem is the stuff that was out there that was an OER was great, but didn't reflect 
anything to do with them. So we took them and we transformed the French one and then we put uh, examples that, you know, we're like, you know, we're talking about Kitchener, for example, we're talking about Toronto, the, the examples rather than, I don't know, going to Paris or going to like London, England. So we're, we're saying, oh, this weekend I'm going to Brantford, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing that feels more like home. That yeah. was important. And the funny thing is, such was the impact with this that we've gotten rid of um, the language textbooks in the degree level as well. Uh, because there's other stuff that we can we can use these and there's other stuff that we can do uh, use to enhance. So that was the, the major, like the, the biggest thing. It was something for students because students wanted something and they don't buy the textbook. <laughs> yeah, I love how localized and contextualized you've made it. I love that, you know, it's the Quebec accent, it's localized dialogue, it's localized um, like context in the, the examples and then it's relevant slang, right? These are, this is the way you would hear spe French spoken if you went to Montreal or Quebec, mm -hmm. which is where it's the most applicable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, it would be even really great to hear some Haitian voices kind of oh, appear cool. in there as well. But yeah, thank you so much, Rita, for thank sharing you. this and to, for, uh, for um, being willing to kind of tell us a bit about the process, because I know it's been so many years in the making and just watching this evolve has been such a treat. Thank yeah. you. I know you'll get lots of questions in the Q&A session as well, and you're getting lots of claps as well. Thank you. All right. Our next presenter is Chance McFarlane, and Chance joins us from the, the School of Trades and Apprenticeship as well. So after 15 years in the welding trade, Chance McFarland decided to go back to school and take the heavy equipment operator program at Conestoga College. After attaining his certificate, including an award for high grades, Chance uh, was, and hearing that there was an opening for a technologist per position, he thought it would be a great fit. The job allows Chance to utilize the skill he gained in his previous work as he continues to gain and develop new ones. He's currently finishing his second season and thoroughly enjoys the teaching and helping students. Chance has also had the privilege of teaching the welding portion of the, cor of the course's shop class, and he's looking forward to continuing learning and growing his career with Conestoga College. Chance, welcome. We're excited to see what you have to share today. Hi, uh, thank you. I forgot to turn on my mic before I shared. <laughs> oh, <laughs> it happens. <laughs> I'm a newbie. No, you're um, doing fine. Go ahead. <laughs> thank you, Jesslyn, uh, and thanks to the other panelists as well. Uh, as Jesslyn said, I'm Chance. So I work for the heavy construction equipment program, uh, the operators program. Uh, today I'm gonna to talk about the backhoe inspection simulator that we've created with BAR Lab. Uh, one of the first and most important things we do before anybody can even operate a machine or start it is a daily circle check. So it's a very vital part um, and it's, it's taught throughout. We keep doing like spot checks on it throughout the entire season. Um, doing them in person is super time consuming. Each student has to do it themselves. We've only got a few machines and typically we've only got two faculty. So getting everyone through it can take a lot of time. Uh, when we were approached about doing something, this was the first thing that came to mind. And uh, yeah, and, and, and we've got a pretty good thing going here. So let's, I'll just run you through, whoop, too far. So here's under a hood, uh, the engine compartment. This is a really, really good representation of what's actually under the hood of one of our backhoes. Uh, and it has all the main things that we have to check before starting our machine, uh, all our oils and, and uh, any of the vital fluids, especially under here. So this is a uh, yeah, really good representation of what we have to do. Uh, at the bottom here, you can see there's a, a little prompt for the students uh that sort of walks them through what they need to check so here we've got uh, a dipstick ready for inspection again you can see the little uh, bar at the bottom telling them to check the fluid by clicking on the dipstick uh, i don't have any video on my presentation unfortunately but right before here we have a fun little animation of a rag wiping off this dipstick and re-dipping it which is uh the actual proper check. Uh, in the top corner, you see a multiple choice box. So this is where the student gets to decide if it's uh, proper or improper state, or in this case, normal or low or overfill. So here's 
the dash or the gauges of our machine, uh, lots of warning lights, symbols. So this is where the student gets to do a proper startup procedure and check all their interior controls, safety features. Um, this is our diagnostics. So I think this will be an excellent teaching tool. Uh, I feel like it's really gonna help to familiarize students with some of the warning lights that they may not see on a daily basis because hopefully there's not that many actually up. <laughs> uh, and then at the bottom here, they can fill out their engine hours, which is a part of our daily inspection as well. So here we have some damage, a pretty badly damaged tire. So they get to check the lug nuts, visually inspect everything. Uh, and again, in the multi-choice box there, they get to, to figure out if it's satisfactory or or damaged. Hopefully in this case, they're gonna pick damaged. Um, this is just some detail that I wanted to point out. I wish I had had a backhoe to take a side-by-side -side picture of this. Uh, I just wanted to sort of showcase VAR Lab's excellent renderings and their attention to detail, which was just incredible. Anybody who's familiar with a backhoe could tell you that, uh, that this is extremely realistic. So they've done, a, they've done an excellent job here. Um, this is just the loader bucket. Uh, simulation moves everybody, like moves our students around the machine in a pretty natural way as we do in the real world. Uh, this is up, up at the front of the machine, obviously, so they can check the bolts, make sure that their bucket's in, good, in a good state. Again, they have the multiple choice box there. Uh, a little more damage. Um, this is also a pretty good view. One of the, this is about the best screenshot I could get of sort of an overall view of the machine, just to give you another example of the, of the excellent job done here. And uh, yeah, so here we can see some damage, a, a leak on the cylinder and some pretty bad damage on a loader arm there. I can assure you that our machine is in much better repair than this one. Uh, here we're inside the cab again. Uh, once the inspection's complete, you're in the operator seat, ready to start the day. Uh, there's these nice little notes that come up at the bottom. Uh, they just sort of contain some extra info that might not be on your checklist. Uh, for example, this one says, we should always make sure fuel is topped up before we leave. Uh, there's another one uh, at some point that says, maintain three points of contact when entering exiting. So these are just nice little things. That's a good safety tip. Uh, it's a good way of reinforcing and reminding our students of the rules and best practices that we try to put forth day to day. Uh, lastly, here we have the results. So after they're completed, the students given these results. Uh, please don't tell anybody I got seven incorrect. Uh, they can scroll through, see what they need to work on, if they have anything that they need to uh, you know, pay a little more attention to or if there's anything that needs improvement. So that's pretty much it. Your secret is safe with us, Chance. We won't tell anybody that you, <laughs> I, I was assuming that you did them incorrectly on purpose. So <laughs> just so we yeah, could see yes, what it yes, was yes, like. Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah, and you're getting lots of kudos here in the, in the chat window and, and from your Thank colleagues. You. I can see Chris kind of leaning in with his puzzled face <laughs> thinking, what can I do with, <laughs> what am I gonna ask Lisa for next week when I talk well, to her? <laughs> I, I, Chris and I probably have a lot of the same uh, troubles, you know, uh, his may be a little more so with COVID, but ours is kind of all the time due to, you know, not having the, the amount of equipment, you know, when you have 30 students and two machines, it's, <laughs> it's a little tough, right, at the start of the year, so. Yeah, yeah. and to, to reset the problems or reset the challenges is probably really hard, especially just to get students some hands-on experience with it before diving in. So I want to touch on briefly. So um, Chris and Rita shared examples of using H5P to support the, the digital learning simulation. And the perk to H5P is that it's a publicly available platform for all Ontario educators. Uh, so anybody can kind of dive in and get their hands dirty with just building something and experimenting with it with teaching. And we have a session later today that's dedicated towards that if you're interested in. And teaching and learning has been running sessions on it all, all the time for the last two years, really. But okay. what you did was a unique partnership with our VAR lab. 
Yes. And so, yeah, yeah. So I want to share a little bit about the VAR lab for our audience. Um, and you can correct me on anything that I, I might be getting wrong. I know we've got Lisa Trimble out in the audience as well, who, so she might chime in with a, a thought or two. But a little bit about Conestoga's VAR lab. Conestoga's virtual and augmented reality lab, VAR lab, was established in 2018 to help bring virtual and augmented reality stimulations like what Chance has shown us today to Conestoga students. And at the onset of the pandemic, they focused on creating orientation simulations for essential traits to help students orient to equipment, equipment and environments and making it possible to spend less time on campus to really meet that need. They're now developing simulations across the college in a wide variety of program areas from flat screen simulations that can be done on a laptop to fully immersive virtual reality. So we have kind of the gamut all the way from like the DIY, just build something cool like what Chris had suggested or what Rita suggested, or take it all the way to the virtual world uh, in your simulations. And this is a really interesting innovation over the last you know, five years that Conestoga has made available to faculty and made available to our, our community as a whole. Just the range of what's possible to develop for your teaching is, is at a whole new level right now. <laughs> yeah, so uh, Chance, what advice might you share about the experience of, of doing the development of the virtual reality with the VAR lab? Um. Uh, I don't really know. It, it was it was a it was a good experience. Uh, you know, one of the trickier things is for us. I mean, it's a backo, so not everybody's going to be super familiar with it, right? So um, there's definitely just a lot of back and forth, and uh, yeah, just just hang in there and keep working on it. And yeah, they, they were they were excellent to work with, and uh, and we just tell them the order we'd like things in, and uh, yeah, it worked out great. So, yeah, real collaboration with a team that's great at their projects, aren't they? Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much, Chance, for sharing. I bet you'll get some interesting questions in the Q and A as well. I'll just point out to the audience that the Q and A is open. So, if you want to drop any questions, you're more than welcome to. Let's maybe give a moment or two, just for people to take a breather and kind of drop in any questions that they might like into the chat window. I'll share that link to the Mentimeter again for anybody who's looking for it. Uh, Lisa, Chance, uh, Lisa says it was brilliant and patient content experts like you that brought this project to life. You are a delight to work with. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. <laughs> you're very humble, but I'm sure that, uh, that like your colleagues, you're very organized uh, and very clear which is always a great, great traits for an educator to have. All right. I, I do my best. <laughs> <laughs> it's working. Okay, so while people are putting in the Q&A, um, I'll introduce our next, um, our next candidate is Carly Zabo. And Carly is a training specialist at the Canadian Institute for Seniors Care at Conestoga College. Carly graduated from McMaster University with Bachelor of Science in Nursing in 2007. And in 2011, she completed a postgrad certificate in critical care nursing at Durham College. In 2019, she was awarded a Master of Science from McMaster. And Carly has a vast array of nursing experience, including pediatric, critical care, palliative care, and gerontology. In Carly's role at Conestoga, she supports the design and delivery of health education and training. Welcome, Carly. Thanks, Jocelyn, and thanks everybody for having us. It's a really neat opportunity to get some creative ideas and to share some really neat resources. So much alike, we had a lot of challenges in terms of healthcare providers being able to practice some of these skills safely. So we've done a great job with low, medium, and high fidelity situations where they can actually go in and work with a simulation patient. Uh, we even have simulated participants where they actually come in and do a live interaction with a participant. But again, some of these things were a little more challenging in a virtual uh, reality kind of opportunity and also giving people the opportunity to practice these at home. Uh, they could access them when they wanted as many times as they wanted and also to give them the opportunity to make choices. 
Uh, the other thing that we really noticed within these um, opportunities was the ability for interprofessional collaboration. We talk a lot about it, but we don't really give good examples or demonstrate or provide the opportunity for students to see how it can actually be optimized for efficient and safe patient care. So those are really some of the opportunities that we really wanted to look at. So today I'd like to share a little bit about the virtual simulation scenarios that we've created within the Affinity Learning Platform. And I echo what everybody else has said, it takes a lot of bravery as a lot of this technology is new. <laughs> you have to be vulnerable. You have to be open to asking questions and play around with it because there's some really cool potentials within. So this wouldn't have been possible without our eCampus project funding. So we do want to acknowledge the Government of Ontario and the virtual learning strategy, as well as the collaborating um, colleges and universities that help make this possible. We were able to build three separate scenarios. Uh, one was focused on a fall in long-term care. Uh, so again, what does this look like from pre-fall? all the way to transferring to hospital. So what are key things that we need to know? When paramedics arrive, one of the biggest challenges they would say is that nobody's around, right? Everybody's dealing with the situation. So they're like, we don't know the building. We don't know where to go. So we give students three different opportunities to say, how do you respond? What's your priority? So we raise awareness that this is a common challenge. And really it means that it's delayed that that person's not getting to hospital fast enough. So we had embedded videos where they would make a choice and then it would give feedback based on that choice. So it's kind of like a choose your own adventure. We also, uh, these modules also focused on dementia. So caring for somebody living with dementia. So what does that mean where a paramedic is, you know, helping somebody across onto a stretcher and then tying them down? How might that person respond if they don't have their hearing aids, they don't have their glasses and they may not have context of their environment or their situation. So we talked about different ways of even just simply putting the stretcher into a chair position and having somebody that was familiar with that person assist them. And the last one was, we're seeing more of a community paramedic role. So how can personal support workers, nurses, and community paramedics work to support somebody living with a chronic condition at home? So in this case, COPD, how would we help support his wishes to remain at home? So these opportunities really provided care providers the opportunity to come together and to practice safe, efficient, person-centered, and evidence-informed care. So just like Chris mentioned, bringing that theory and practice together, not just telling them that interprofessional care needed to happen, but actually showing them how it could happen and where we could see those improvements. This platform was new to us, but it has lots of potential. Um, right now, it is Creative Commons um, license, so it is open access, but we do have also a closed access version that we're using within the PSW program right now. We used a choose your own adventure, so in many areas, students have the opportunity to make a choice and get some feedback based on their choice. The creative services team at Conestoga College really helped us bring this to life, so we have really high production videos images and audio. For example, there's an opportunity to have a 911 call. For most care providers, they don't practice how to make a 911 call. So the first time they're picking up that phone, they're really not sure what they're being asked or the information that they're going to need to be provided. Additionally, a lot of times whoever's making the 911 call doesn't have the necessary information that they need. It might be a receptionist, it might be a volunteer. So we really need to practice what are the things they're going to ask me and how can I make that more efficient to get the patient the care that they need. It has vital sign simulator, it has opportunities to do, you know, multiple select, matching. Um, there's even one where you can type in a response questions you want to ask the patient and based on the feedback that you've built in, it will give students that opportunity. There is a 360. We didn't get, we really wanted to do that, but we didn't get to. So I'm hoping with our next iteration, seeing the work that you're doing, Chris, is really cool to think about how we could do that in the environment as well. Where are you going to grab this? You know, how are you going to set up that environment? We gave them lots of opportunities to say, what is your priority? Is it the person's neck? Is it their hip? Is it putting on the splint? So students really had to pick what was the next thing and what order should I do things? Because in a complex environment, you're being pulled lots of different ways. So learning about how to make those decisions was really, really important. I'm gonna show you a video where we integrated also the opportunity to say, what does it feel like from the patient's lens? What are important things that I need to know about how that person might be feeling? In this situation, the person doesn't have their hearing aids and care providers are asking them to do something. It's a little quiet, Carly. Yeah, it's meant to be.
How's that? Can you hear me better now? Oh, much better. Great. Would you like to get up in your wheelchair? Sure. Okay. Okay. Sorry, I should have prefaced that. <laughs> So it is, it is a really good example of the reality of somebody missing their hearing aid. So imagine somebody's in a long-term care home and they're urgently transferred to hospital. We don't really think about hearing aids and glasses, yet we know that's a great strategy to prevent delirium and further hospital complications. So in this, we actually give students the ability to walk in their shoes and feel this example. And then when we're transporting the patient, you know, we say, here's your hearing aids and glasses as we're handing over those transfer papers. So really reinforcing that person's experience and how important that is. In each of the virtual simulations, this was our first time learning about the importance of pre-brief. How do you prepare somebody for a safe situation if they're gonna see a senior fall and break their hip, right? Uh, we don't have contact with those students, so how do we safely do that in an asynchronous format? So we have some pre-brief materials in there. We also have a asynchronous debrief. So after you know going through this, what did you learn? What was the experience like? Have you had experiences like this? They can print that and they can provide it to their instructor. There was the ability to evaluate within Affinity, but we chose not to do that because we really wanted to create that safe environment. They could choose whatever they wanted and nobody would be looking at what score or points they got. Um, for healthcare, that was important. And we also integrated a facilitator guide, knowing that some of the facilitators may not be comfortable knowing how to use this. So we included opportunities to also have a structured facilitated debrief and then further high impact opportunities that they could extend even beyond the actual module itself. So these are just a few of our repository of virtual simulation projects, uh, ranging from, as Jocelyn mentioned, sways that are just interactive case studies to high-end production suites, to animated graphics, um, and really trying to get those healthcare providers as close to the skill set as possible. And if anybody would like more information, I'm happy to share, as I know Affinity is a new platform, and I can put my contact information into the chat. And I'm also going to paste the Affinity um, community so that if there's anything uh, that's really interesting or excites you, you're welcome to explore other resources there as well. Thank you, Carly. It's such a great perspective. And I think I just had an empathetic learning experience myself, obviously. <laughs> I can't hear um, you. Yeah. yeah. Why, why can't I hear? Oh, because I can't hear. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah. And I love that um, that you really focus towards that empathy building and really understanding the patient's context. We know that so much value, or the research seems to substantiate that so much value out of simulations like this is really about the affective experience, those feelings, feelings that we have, right? Getting people over the nerves of something new, getting Getting them through that mistake making period, helping them manage their parasympathetic responses to stressful situation, right? Helping them manage and regulate their breathing and, and just start to become accl acclimated with the experience of doing that thing so that when they go into actually doing that thing, they're not nervous or excited or right? So many of those um, are really in support of that. And you've really done that work to help build that patient empathy, get students through that, those learning pieces and give them something that they could, they could use across all modes of learning as well. Yeah, thank you so much for being willing to follow up as well. In the interest of time, I'm going to move forward to our final presenter, Adam. So Adam Ziegler, is joining us today. And Adam Ziegler joined Conestoga as faculty last year after a long and rewarding career in law enforcement. In addition to his expertise as a police officer and in running his own consultation firm, Adam has also held positions as a K-12 physical health educator in Waterloo area schools and has been a teacher educator in WLU's Bachelor of Education program. Hey, I graduated from there, Adam. An avid gamer his whole life, he's deeply involved in helping to create meaningful and engaging virtual reality learning experiences in the community safety programs to help students get excited about learning while they develop skills and real world, pro real world problems and solve real world problems in risk-free simulated environments. His research interests focus on ways to enhance learner meaning-making through gamified and simulated reality experiences. Welcome, Adam. Thank you, Jess, and thank you for having me today and uh, our amazing and talented panelists. So let me pull up our screen here. 
Um, so good morning. And during the COVID pandemic, there was a paradigm shift to develop digital simulations to augment the available tools that professors in our community services programs could utilize. And I'm, I'll speak briefly about how our police foundations, advanced police studies, our Bachelor of Canadian Criminal Justice degree and our protection security investigations and fire fighting programs have benefited from digital simulations. And I apologize if you can hear the construction. I'm in the basement of uh, Dune here in E-Wing, and it sounds like they're right above my head, so uh, I do apologize. We don't hear um, any of it, Adam. It's okay. <laughs> okay. Well, I can. It feels like the whole building is vibrating. Um, Scenario-based teaching has been part of police services education for many years. And there are procedures that students need to learn to follow exactly in accordance with uh, the law. And they need to be able to practice in a safe, free, risk-free environment um, where different scenarios might unfold. Community services started with our crime scene investigation project in collaboration with Expert VR, an outside provider. Our various, our, our extremely talented and wonderful Lisa Trimble, um, Russell Fulbert from IT services, and then our talented subject matter experts from the community services team. And we developed seven crime scene scenarios. And in those crime scene scenarios, students attend the scene as police officers. Uh, they're going to try and solve one of seven different crime scenes. And while in the diner, they can collect evidence using different me uh, methods, uh, taking photos, collecting fingerprints, bagging and tagging guns, knives, hair, fibers reviewing security camera footage. And these crime scenes range from a break and enter to theft, robbery, and murder with various um, weapons. And here is some stills of our crime scene diner. And we also have our traffic simulation. So I'm going to click on the YouTube video and bring that up and i'm just going to stop it Cheslin, you're able to see that no problem no we don't see the youtube video you may need to reshare to show your whole okay screen. let me go back um how about now perfect so i'm going to allow this to play and just sort of talk over it our students responded well to our first sim so subsequently we developed a traffic collision oh, simulation yeah, that's and we have a, a voice that narrates, we have uh, menu tools that allow the officer, the students to be able to uh, gather information, whether it's the insurance ownership. Uh, there are various tools that they can use to photograph the scene. They can take measurements of uh, the scene, they can take and measure the uh, length of deceleration marks or other types of evidence interacting with the various avatars. All of this information allows the students um, to be able to complete the Ontario Ministry of Transportation's motor vehicle accident reports and make important decisions about what types of charges might be laid. And the success of these simulations laid the foundation for more uh, simulations to be developed in the community services, including just, including our firefighter uh, scenarios that help students uh, practice putting together self-contained breathing apparatuses, hazard material spills, and search and rescue in a building burning building. And these scenarios can be done in a flat screen, uh, 2D, or in, they're developed for some in a 3D environment. 
So these SIMs can be a useful part of formative evaluations and they can be used as well as summative evaluations. Part of my role as the VR lead is to write, support, and assist professors with student-centered pedagogy. In test runs with students, this is what they had to say about their experiences. It was really interesting, a new way of learning I've never experienced before. It allowed you to get a feel for a crime scene and how much evidence there really could be. And part of the crime scene, they collect their evidence, um, they input it, and then they get feedback from the professor about you know, whether they use the proper techniques, whether they use the right uh, a plastic bag or a paper bag, for instance. Some of the other student feedback around critical decision-making skills and ease of, ease of use. I've enjoyed using the choose where to start the investigation and determine the appropriate steps moving forward. I essentially ran the whole inve investigation and had the choice as to what I would do next. This made me think about what the appropriate next steps are and the simulation was straightforward and easy to run. Feedback in terms of engagement. Many of our students all provided meaningful qualitative data uh, around it being engaging. It's uh, like a video game, um, risk-free. So where did we go from there? Well, with, uh, like I said, the talented Lisa Trimble, we are uh, developing uh, new simulations for uh, protection, security, investigations. I have the honor of working with uh, Lisa right now. Uh, it's an evolving dynamic process. And one of the things that I, I want to say, and this is just a little plug for um, Catherine Billiger and her wonderful teaching and learning uh, crew. You know, if we talk about Corey or Nathan or Elon or Sherry or Jess or Nazarene, Lisa Trimble, Sarah and Jess, there's all little nuggets that fit into these simulations. And whether it's the, the pedagogy where you're sitting there trying to look at the course outcomes and the, and the, the courses themselves and, and decide how the simulations are going to fit in, there's always some little piece from those micro-credential courses that really assist uh, myself working with Lisa and the VR team and Russ in developing this. And as I said before, there are flat simulations, there are 3D. I know right now our biggest challenge in the new PSI program, Lisa and I have been meeting with the team and talking about you know, uh, storyboards. I've been developing storyboards. What's a 3D application? What's a 2D application? And you know, it's a constant challenge to uh, figure out what these things look like. It's, it's kind of muddy at first. And then once you do get a product, we send it out to the students, let them test drive it, get some feedback. For the traffic simulation, one of the things that we, we found was the measuring tool wasn't uh, as effective as it could be. And we were able to go back and improve upon it. So it's, a, you know, as we joke around, version 1.0, you know, maybe two or three years will be at version 5.0. I think you're echoing something that a few of the facilitators or the panelists have shared today, Adam, that really this is an iterative process. You can build something beautiful, but it's only going to get more beautiful with time. Uh, with time and student feedback and more experience. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. There's really some, some uh, wonderful examples there of the way that the VAR Lab can support developing these scenarios where students can get this practice experience. And I love that you've shared that, you know, it can be a 2D experience, you can play around just on your laptop, or you can go full immersive. Um, and one thing to keep in mind too, Adam, maybe you can add some extra context to this, is I do believe Conestoga has VR labs that students can do these activities in. Do you want to, do you know anything about that or do you want to share about that? I know we have the mobile VR lab, and I know that um, Lisa can speak to this, that um, I think there's another session that she's part of. It's uh, going to be going around. And I know that we've been working on names like the Viper lab down here in the room that I'm in that 
hopefully is going to become community services uh, own virtual reality lab. That's amazing. So there's just so much growth here happening uh, and there's so much change over time. And we know that just even within Conestoga ourselves, um, it's going to continue growing and changing. So we have time just for a question or two, get your questions into um, the Mentimeter so that we can take a look at it. Uh, and here's one for the, v the virtual reality simulation experts on the panel. For the VR learning, were there challenges in terms of meeting accessibility standards? And if so, how did you navigate that? Adam, feel free. Yes, that was one of the things that Lisa and I uh, talked about. Um, in the first one, we had a jukebox that was always playing and someone who uh, is single-sided deafness um, it was challenging for me to hear the avatar or to be able to navigate. So things like accessibility, realizing that we needed to uh, make it the environment very friendly. So turning the jukebox off once we started so that people who have hearing um, challenges are able to participate in the VR lab. Um, so again, going back to many of the micro-credential courses and understanding the lenses that are put forward and then applying them um, to the VR lab. It's really interesting. Um, and it's certainly something that would always be present, you know, the accessibility of what we're developing. Um, and many people don't really realize that the tools themselves are accessible, can be made accessible. It's how we design the learning experience that creates an accessible learning experience. In this, in HYP, in Unity, in Affinity, whatever it is that you're developing, the accessibility is, is more informed by um, the development of the experience than it is necessarily the, the prohibitions of the tool itself. Um, so it's always kind of food for thought. Any of the other panelists like to contribute? have another question up here as well. All right, so we've talked a little bit about the technologies used for the simulation, H5P in the case of Rita and Chris, we have Affinity used by Carly Sabo, and then Adam and Chance both had the chance to work with the VAR lab, so we're likely using Unity. Uh, is there a list of simulations that other instructors or courses could access? These may be interesting. There might be some interesting cross use for many of these. Does anybody want to touch on, especially those um, built or developed for the eCampus Ontario pilots, how those are being broadly shared, or maybe how you shared your own H5P resources um, or OERs? Anybody want to share, talk about how your resources are being shared? Yes, I realize I'm not part of the panelists, but I may be able to answer this question briefly, if you like. Um, we're working with the OLC to create a repository of teaching resources that are, that are being developed. And we also want to include OER resources in that so that anybody can catalog and find them and use them. And I will also put a link to the SharePoint site where you can see some of the work that the VAR lab has done and uh, how it's being used and some of the stories about that too. But I agree that these need to be in a space where everybody can access them and use them if they need them. So we're, 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 we're doing that. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, Chris, you had your hand up as well. How are you sh uh, sharing your resources? Well, we, ours kind of live on our um, course shells. And so since they're, so specific to the equipment and products that we're using and the environments that we're using them. What we've got so far has been kind of kept within our faculty kind of database. And um, like I said, they would live on those course shells. So whoever's teaching those courses has access to all this information. I would imagine that as things expand to become more generic, if we would add um, uh, snippets of YouTube lessons and things like that, then we'd be able to more, uh, uh, broadly offer this. Yeah, it kind of it gets shared forward within the teaching community itself. It would be nice to see some broad sharing. I'll point out that a few of the resources, such as uh, Rita's um, OERs for language learning, um, 
And most of the VLS funded projects from eCampus Ontario are shared at the Ontario Open Library. And I'll put the URL here in the chat window. Um, so those resources, you can come here and you can look for anything related to your content area. And these are all resources that are typically, not exclusively, but typically developed by Ontario educators for Ontario education. Um, some of them are, are built by other members within Canada or in North America or globally, but many of the resources here we're starting to find um, are built within Ontario. And I'll point out as well that anything created in H5P as part of the H5P studio from eCampus Ontario, these resources are going to be discoverable in the open library. So the open library is your good one-stop shop. But many of these resources here in the H5P catalog are freely available exemplars of what people might do it, be doing. So a lot of the times while something is in that iterative state of just working on it and building it, it might not appear here in the catalog, but you can find them there once they're kind of like fully finished out. I wanna say thank you to all of our panelists and to all of our audience for coming in today, for asking your questions and for sharing your knowledge. Thank you so much. We had some trivia built, but maybe we'll hang on to it for another day. I just want to say uh, a warm thank you and congratulations for the work that you've done on all of these projects. It's so remarkable to see how far you've come uh, and just how much resources are now available at the college to support you all. In about 15 minutes, we're going to join over into a new Zoom link to see our keynote address, but thank you all for attending today's keynote, our faculty panel.